Um, Steve is a legitimate soil scientist, uh, having earned a PhD in the topic at Colorado State University. Um, but he's been working at General Mills for about six years on their regenerative ag efforts across North America, but especially here in the Northern Plains at the supply shed in North Dakota and Minnesota. So um, expecting kind of a broad overview of both the science and the policy around these topics. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, yeah, good to see some faces I've seen on screens mostly, but uh, yeah, happy to be here. Um, it's always kind of stressful to figure out how to condense a lot of this stuff. So I, what, I've, what I went for is more like touching on a little bit of everything, but, you know, I'm going to save plenty of time just so we can have some discussion and can kind of keep it pretty informal. So if there's questions um, in the room or online, um, just raise your hand. We can just kind of address things as they come along. So, um, so like Anna said, I, I've been at General Mills for about six years. Um, I'm an ag science lead. So I basically work on um, pretty small ag science team that we have at General Mills, but there's, you know, a handful of us now that have kind of scientific backgrounds and are working on our ag sustainability kind of uh, commitments and work. Um, but we also work closely with the, the global impact team, which is more on the corporate side that really manage all these commitments. So we have a pretty cool partnership within the company um, where we have some science folks, some corporate folks all working on these commitments together. Um, and uh, happy to talk about the transition from like academia into corporate world or like any of those sorts of things that might be of interest too. Um, so no topic is like is off limits here. Um, so mostly over the last six years, I've been you know setting up partnerships and programs in our key sourcing regions to help accelerate adoption of these regenerative ag systems. And I'll talk about what I mean by regenerative ag. Um, and then also as part of the science team, figuring out how do we monitor the impacts of that adoption to soil health and water and biodiversity and farmer economics and climate. Um, and so we'll dig into a couple of those things. Um, but just first, uh, you know, the General Mills is a food company. Uh, we have lots of different types of products. So I just put a couple of those up here on the screen. So a lot of cereal products that you might know, some dairies so like yogurt. Um, ha recently acquired a pet food company in Blue Buffalo. Uh, so we're working a lot in like grain cropping systems, some in dairy, um, not as much on meat, maybe a little bit of uh, poultry now coming into the system with, with Blue Buffalo. So, um, but I, I kind of mostly work on the grain cropping systems. So here's some of the things I was hoping to touch today. So. Um, Scope three climate goals. Uh, I'll talk about what I mean by scope three, if that's a new term, uh, but um, this is kind of a big trend in the industry, I'd say that's, that's driving a lot of focus and investment in climate smart ag, regenerative agriculture from the food and ag uh, company standpoint. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction to that and what our goal looks like. Um, we also have a regenerative agriculture commitment and ambition. So I'll talk a little bit about that and what that means. Um, you know, being a kind of scientist in the in the team, we've prioritized a lot of research and really advancing the science of regenerative ag and climate smart ag and these impacts. So I'll talk about how we approach that monitoring and some of the research that we've done. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the things I'm excited about uh, that we're kind of looking to next. And then we'll have plenty of time for a discussion, I think. So. So um, General Mills has 10 corporate commitments. I know this is probably hard to see, So, um, but really we're, we've prioritized three, three of our 10 commitments as a company. Um, so these are kind of public sustainability related goals and commitments. Um, and the three that we've prioritized are um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2030 across our full value chain um, and reaching that zero by 2050. Uh, advancing regenerative agriculture on a million acres by 2030, and then designing 100% of our packaging to be recyclable or, or, or reusable by 2030. So I'm, I'm only mostly working on those, uh, those first two, the greenhouse gas and regenerative ag commitments, and that's what I'll be diving into here a bit. So I mentioned this scope three climate commitment. And so um, raise your hand if you've heard of the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Okay, couple. Um, so, uh, so first, before I get into that, I'll just talk a little bit about these three scopes. So any organization or company um, has three scopes of emissions. Scope one is all your direct emissions. So this is, um, you know, at your facilities or vehicles, like for General Mills, this is all the energy that we would use in our plants to actually manufacture food. So it's within your owned operations, any energy related emissions associated with 
um, your business. So a lot of our a lot of our scope one emissions are like drying pet food. Uh, you know, it's it's things related to those kind of heat intensive processes. Scope two emissions are all of the electricity that you buy as a company. So the emissions associated with cre creating the electricity to run your operations. Still, it's about the things that you control. Scope three is all the things that are outside of your control, but kind of within the whole supply chain and value chain of your company and products. So scope three is an incredibly complex, fascinating new world in carbon accounting that, uh, that I'm deep in the weeds on now. But, um, but this is really where agriculture comes in to focus for a lot of the food and ag companies, because the biggest source of, of our emissions in the food and ag industry is on farms in, in agriculture. Um, and so, you know, a little bit about scope three, it's, it's everything from your purchase goods and services. So these are the ingredients that we procure from farms. It's all the shipping, it's all the packaging. It's even downstream after we've made the product. It's, you know, if, if you're baking a cake in your oven, a Betty Crocker cake in your oven, the emissions associated with that energy are part of our scope three footprint. And even in the, even in the landfill post, you know, post use. So it's anything you can think of, um, which makes scope three accounting really complex, um, a good example that I heard from, from a liquor company trying to calculate their scope three emissions, they had to figure out how much ice people use when they drink their drinks so they could use the energy to make the ice as part of their scope three footprint. So it's a really fascinating world. Um, General Mills actually was the first company in any sector to set a science-based target that covers our scope three. So science-based targets initiative is, um, it's a, kind of a global organization uh, supported by groups like uh, World Wildlife uh, Foundation and the World Resources Institute and, and a bunch of others, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, all really trying to help companies set targets that are in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. So how do you keep, you know, what level of ambition should climate, uh, should companies have to keep warming below 1.5 degrees C? How do, like, what's our ambition level? So that's where our 30% reduction by 2030 comes from. It's from the science-based targets initiative that helps companies set these goals. We were the first in 2015 to set one that covers our scope three. And now thousands of companies have these kinds of scope three goals, including many of the big food and ag companies. So that's what's driving a lot of investment in climate smart ag. A lot of these carbon markets um, are related to that. So here's our scope three, uh, well, our, our, full, our full footprint and our goal. Um, so you can see ag and the transformation of those ingredients is about 39% of our total footprint. This is our scope one, uh, you know, and scope two, it's about 5%. Um, we've actually zeroed out our scope two because we, uh, have 100% renewable energy, but, um, yeah, so, so scope one, the things that we control, it's a very small percentage. Scope three is really where most of the work needs to happen. Um, and especially in agriculture, which is the biggest source for us. So that's that's a little bit about climate commitment and like and scope three and that's uh, it's a big trend that's kind of having a lot of people focus in this space. All the rules like as we speak are still being sorted out for how companies do these types of scope three inventories and um, what kinds of data are good enough to know how to do this stuff. I'll talk about our approach a bit later to to quantifying our footprint. Um, but yeah, I think that's enough on climate for now. Any any questions about scope three climate science based targets? Um, maybe one last thing to note is while it's been voluntary for, uh, you know, to date, there's a lot of new regulations coming out from, you know, California just passed um, a law saying that companies operate over a billion dollars of revenue operating in California will have to disclose their scope three emissions um, by 2026 or seven. Um, also, the SEC um, has said for publicly traded companies, well, it's not passed yet, but it's likely that all publicly traded companies will have to disclose their scope one, two, and three emissions. So it's moving more into this um, regulatory space where it's been, it started as voluntary. Yeah. This is related to life cycle analysis. Do they overlap or is life cycle analysis strictly scope one, two? Nope, this is all, this is based on life cycle analysis. Um, so that's kind of how we do the inventories. It's really rooted in that assessment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, as a, International company that's based in Minnesota. Like, how much do you kind of follow the like the rule comes out in California? Or if the rule comes out like this in a given state, how much do you internally track? Um, it's. I mean, it's definitely. I'm not sure exactly how 
how these specific regulations impact our company, but because we've already been sort of at the forefront at, from the voluntary standpoint, we're kind of ahead of the game a bit, which is nice, I think. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely have to, you know, we're, we're trying to read through the SEC rules and understand what that means. But what's been nice, I think, and what, what I think should happen is like these regulatory frameworks that are coming out, they should be based on all of this work we've already done in the voluntary space for, you know, how these things should be done. They shouldn't create new rules. Like let's use, you know, the rules that are already being stood up for how to do this stuff. So I think as long as we get those, you know, we don't have to create a whole nother methodology for measuring our footprint or something. I think, I think it should work out. Okay. Um, so, so we also have this regenerative ag goal, which is not just about climate, um, although it's related. And, you know, there's lots of different definitions of regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, there's not, you know, General Mills didn't invent it. Um, so we kind of have a perspective on it, but, you know, aren't the one, aren't trying to seek to be the only ones defining it or working on it. But this is kind of how we talk about it here. Um, you know, first, it's really rooted in these principles, which are kind of your basic soil health principles that have been around for a long time. Um, really with this idea that first, we need to understand the context. It's not, um, you know, maybe as opposed to the way kind of sustainable agriculture was approached in the past in the industry, it was more like checklist of practices, do this, this, and this, and you're sustainable. This is more of a very like adaptive, context-specific, place-based, uh, holistic set of principles that has to be adapted. But it's, it's things like reducing disturbance, maximizing diversity, keeping the soil covered, keeping a living root in the ground as long as possible throughout the year, and integrating livestock. And so these are the things that we know um, I'll just skip ahead here for a second. These are things that we know can help repair these ecosystem processes and just make farms function um, better. You know, so this is a great picture from Oklahoma of a flooded field on the left that can't infiltrate any of this water. Um, and that water is taking away sediment and nutrients and things into the waterway. So it's not great economic, economically for the farmer because they can't use that water to grow crops and it has environmental impacts. Whereas this farm on the right has this restored water cycle, all that water's infiltrating, they can use it to grow things. And so this is kind of what regenerative ag is about to us. It's really about it repairing and enhancing the function of these agricultural ecosystems, which has environmental and economic benefits. Um, and so we define it as a holistic principles-based approach to farming and ranching that seeks to strengthen ecosystems and community resilience. Um, and so we've got principles, we've got outcomes, it's more holistic than just about climate, but it's also a very important lever given agriculture is the biggest source of our scope three emissions. Um, so I kind of sit at that intersection too between our regenerative ag commitment and our climate commitment and how do the two, how does progress on one impact progress on the other? Um, that's a very, we can talk for hours about that probably. Um, so, a little bit about the way that I guess we started thinking about this um, back in 2019 when we made the commitment was um, how, do, how do we accelerate adoption? I mean, this is really what it's ultimately about um, is how do we accelerate adoption of, this, of these principles on the landscape in these places that we source our ingredients? Um, you know, we're probably about here in this like adoption diffusion curve. Uh, it's, you know, a small percentage of farmers that have really embraced all of these principles and are at the kind of leading edge of figuring these things out. And so one of the key things that we need to do is invest in those innovators and early adopters to help them continue to generate the know-how of like in each of these contexts, how do you implement these principles in ways that's better for the farm itself and better for, you know, all these outcomes because what works in the Red River Valley of Minnesota is very different from what works in Kansas. And so we have to support these innovators and early adopters. Um, and we also have to build their capacity to share those learnings because kind of what happens next is, you know, these learnings get translated and communicated throughout this, the farming communities through social networks, farmer to farmer mentoring, these, you know, social networks and, um, and also, you know, effective communications about you know, what practices work, what are the impacts? And then ultimately we need to normalize it um, to reach these later adopters. It, it, has, it can't just be some thing that, you know, certain farmers are doing that's sort of weird or out of the normal, you know, this is it's like, it's gotta become the normal way that farming is done to have these principles integrated 
And that, that requires really removing these cultural and technical barriers to making it possible. And then ultimately institutionalizing it through markets and policies, just so that's sort of the way things are done, you know. So in practice, that for us has meant a lot of different programs um, and a lot of different places uh, in our key sourcing region. So here's just like a map of where some of our projects are touching down. Um, and really our approach has been to support locally led initiatives, um, try to be collaborative. You know, there's, there's other companies that will have like one program. It's like, this is our program and we're gonna use that everywhere. For us, we've tried to be more adaptive and support you know, the capacity of local organizations and communities to lead projects. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about what a couple of those look like. Um, we did start out early on with what we're called regenerative ag pilots because we were trying to figure out what sort of resources can we invest in and support to help farmers down this regenerative path to help them implement these principles. And so some of those things that we supported included education. So having free access to multiple day soil health workshops and, um, you know, and really having, you know, field days and sort of things like this to get farmers exposed and understand what the, these principles are and how they work and how they can be applied. One-on-one um, -on -one coaching is really important. Um, so having access to someone that can come to your farm, sit at your kitchen table and understand your farm's unique context, opportunities, challenges, your goal for your farm, and help you navigate all of these really complex decisions each year, you know, with the weather um, and help navigate, you know, potential pitfalls in, in implementing some of these principles and practices. Um, the next one, like I mentioned before, is like building community, um, you know, having a network of other farmers to learn with and go down this path with is, is probably the most critical thing that we've um, done here uh, in some of these pilots is just connect these farmers together so they don't feel like they're the only ones in their area doing it. Um, and they've really supported and learned from each other. This is also where we've layered a lot of research. So we've got, you know, for example, in, in Canada, we've got 45 farms, all part of this like regenerative ag pilot that are all receiving this coaching and part of this community. And um, they're all at different points on their journey. Some people have been doing this stuff for a while. Some people are brand new to it. We have organic farms and conventional farms, large farms, small farms. And so we were like, that's a perfect opportunity to do some on-farm research and monitor what's happening to soils and insects and birds and economics and try to monitor these, these changes on these farms over time. Uh, so that's, so we've, we've done a ton of research um, as part of this in, in Canada and Kansas, some in Michigan too. Um, and then we've started to, to layer in some of these financial incentives into this program with um, payments for outcomes and ecosystem services through through ecosystem service markets, um, which is a whole can of worms that we can probably maybe open in this in the discussion. Um, some other things that we've got going on, uh, especially here in Minnesota, um, there's been a lot of cool projects coming from conservation districts where they want to do soil health demonstrations, and so um, this is where you know we'll provide cost share for practices like cover crops or no-till over multiple years to just help farmers really demonstrate and test and learn on their own farms um, with help from, you know, conservation districts that provide the technical assistance and are also fostering some of that, um, you know, culture building and communication. Um, and then we've also really tried to figure out how do we just alleviate bottlenecks to widespread adoption? And one of those key bottlenecks is this technical assistance capacity and the staffing of local conservation organizations. And so we, we've launched a partnership with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that's a competitive grants program. So anybody can really apply. Um, I think we've got five different grantees just here in Minnesota alone um, that can apply for grants to essentially help them run their own programs um, that they've designed and help them staff them and get the funding that they need to do it. So. It's supporting lots of different approaches uh, from lots of different organizations, but it's been a great public-private partnership where we can pool our funds with other companies and the federal government to, to really support a lot of these local organizations. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of the things that we've got going on in the Red River Valley in Minnesota and North Dakota and projects that we're working on with Anna too. Um, so, so we've got this program in Wilkin County, just to give you an example of like 
where some of our investments are going. Um, you know, we provided them some assistance for staffing capacity because they, you know, are doing a million things at conservation districts, but they had someone that really wanted to focus on soil health and outreach to farmers on soil health. They just didn't have the staff capacity to do it. So we provided them the funding to hire people that could take off some workloads. So they had, you know, a full-time dedicated soil health person to do this outreach to farmers. And uh, they also didn't have consistent cost share funding. They, you know, weren't able to get a lot of equip money or, you know, any of these kind of federal farm bill program uh, support. So we provided them cost share funding for three to five years to, to really engage farmers in this longer term process of trying practices. And just in one, um, you know, over the course of one winter, you know, this is in Wilkin County, which is one of the most conventionally tilled kind of, you know, big production acre, uh, you know, areas in the country, they were able to sign up, you know, 50 farmers to try things like cover crops and reduce till and some of these practices that many of them have never tried before. And Kim has said at, at the Wilkin County Conservation District, has said, you know, it's really completely changed the conversation about soil health in that place to have that many farmers all trying this new thing at once and have a dedicated staff person really helping to foster that uh, conversation. So that's been a really cool project. Here's just some of the pictures that that Kim has shared with us about, you know, the cover crops going in and growing you know, in between corn, in between soybeans. Um, I think this is sugar beets. So um, yeah, lots of cool practices going in the ground. Uh, Anna, do you want to share anything about this project? Some of the research that you've got going on? Yeah, um, sure. Um, so uh, because I have these three-year contracts, I wanted to see if we did measure any effects on the soil based on those contracts. And so we are sampling the beginning and the end of the contracts and pairing them with conventional labor to see if we can show any measurable effects. And then it's not that part of the PhD project. Yeah. So that's been very cool. Um, uh, just another kind of conservation district program up in Kitson County. They really wanted to see what they could do with strip till. Um, and so we provided some, again, cost share to help get some custom strip tilling done because nobody really owned a strip till machine up there. So they couldn't actually try it and see what it, what it looks like. Um, but we were able to see, you know, higher yields in 2021. We're getting lots of pictures about, you know, snurt. So we could see lots less, lots of less erosion in the strip tilled sites versus the conventional sites. Um, so it's it's pretty amazing what you can do with just like some flexible funding and very proactive people that want to just go try new things. Um, I feel like that's been a really important role that we've played. It's like we're not some big federal program. We don't have all these requirements or restrictions on how funding gets used. It's like we just step in when there's a really good idea and it. It like leads to really impactful change and people have bought strip till machines up in this area now because they've been able to try them and see how they work and so we're starting that snowball hopefully um, up there so that was kind of two programs we've got like i think 12 different things that we're supporting in minnesota alone but so there's like just too much to cover but um yeah happy to talk more about any other sorts of programs or perspectives on things um there's questions now or we could always save them to the end but um i don't see any questions online either so i'll just keep i'll keep going along but feel free to to jump in oh yeah yeah what's the what's the crop there that sugar beets yeah so, okay that's what i thought but i mean they won't but they were it's interesting that, um, I mean, it seems like there is like a market difference of improvement with strip tilling. That's, yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, especially because that was a really dry, uh, dry spring too. And so reducing the disturbance reduces evaporation. And so um, I think especially in those dry springs, potentially there's some really big impacts. I mean, the big thing is wind erosion. I mean, that, that was really the main yeah, reason sure. why they're kind of, excited about strip till and these mm -hmm. systems, but yeah. yeah. And it's been a long time since I've talked about sugar beets really, but they seem really sensitive to changing practices. So showing a yield, I feel like showing a yield increase like that 
for people who are sensitive about changing their practices can be a win for the competition. Yeah. Going for data is not that striking, but it, it's pretty neutral. You can grow comparable sugar beets with a strip fill drink and you have less than a It's neutral in this case, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You do have a pain factor. That's one thing that farmers sometimes I I hear with a voice about the school is that um you know having to match the roads with all the equipment. There are some complications that yeah. Yeah, adoption is just slow with beets because they're on 20 smooth rows and other things are not, and so you can't get the same routine for everything. Is that what were you gonna say, Bobby? Well, I, I, I kind of related to that, I guess in a way. You know, none of these things, we tend to think about some of these things kind of as being binary, but they are not. You know, it's not good, bad. Uh, it's always, we improve something and then something else, it's actually more complicated. There are some unintended consequences. Um, I was just thinking when you show the picture of the uh, flooded field versus the other one, the first thing that came to my mind, I work with nitrogen, nitrate leaching. Um, you know, it's probably happening more on the other side. So on one side you're losing phosphorus and water and, and soil, and the other one maybe you're losing more nit nit nitrogen. And so I'm interested in, in hearing more about your scope three goal because that's really what is the challenge. You know, it's how, how do we measure these things? We keep telling farmers, you know, reducing NQO or emissions is important. But what is the dollar amount? What what you know, all the downstream effects of having that nitrous oxide escaping. How how much what's the dollar amount um to that um reduction? Anyway, yeah. Just more of a comment, but yeah. Um just wondering what, what you take is on yeah. that or if you have some some information to show with that. So I guess two reactions is agreed on like you change one thing you have another problem to solve um i think that's you know part of the challenge with focusing on just one one practice i mean that's really why we come back to all these principles because so like um minimizing disturbance was kind of the the principle and focus for that strip till project um but it raises all sorts of other issues when you're talking about this you know this field versus this one you know, on nitrate leaching, well, it's important that they didn't just reduce tillage, but that they all, this, you can't see it, but they have a green growing plant there that's actually probably tying up that nitrogen so that it's not leaching as much. You know, it's, it's never just about kind of one change, but it's about how do you integrate all of these principles together in the right way for that system. And that's, I think that's when you can unlock, you know, a, a system that's actually working better. Because we often see that it's like, people try one thing and they're like, ah, well, didn't work or it's not, um, you know, it's created this other problem. It's because it's not, you're, you're not thinking about the, you're not thinking about the system holistically and how you integrate all of these principles together. You just change one thing. Um, and so that's that kind of systems thinking and systems approach has been part of that educational journey. I think that is, is really important piece of this. Um, on like the how much does it how much is it worth, or uh, are, are you talking about like how much um, you know how much is a nitrous oxide like a ton of CO two equivalents of nitrous oxide like worth uh, to a company like General Mills or like what what does it mean for the farmer? Yeah, well, for, for both, you know, because again, I, I think that that's that's where we have the most difficulty because as as we alluded early on. It's, Extremely complicated. There are so many different things when you're looking at you not know, just what it costs to produce the product, but then you know the whole life cycle analysis of that. Mm -hmm. And coming up with a a dollar value that says, you know, this is how much it's worth. Yeah. How how close are we to, to having some, you know, fairly good reliable information about this? Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, and maybe this is not where you're going, but it's like, there's a couple like, um, dollar values that have been put on like the cost of carbon. Like what's the social cost of carbon, for example, uh, you know, the federal government has, I think it's something like nine, I could be wrong. It's like $96 per ton of, of carbon is, is what the, 
cost of a ton of carbon is to society as a whole leading to climate change. So some people use that as a benchmark for understanding, you know, what this stuff is worth. Um, you know, in like the California cap and trade market, carbon is more like, like hovering around $30 per ton, I think. Some people use that as a benchmark. When we're talking about these like voluntary greenhouse gas goals, I think it's maybe harder to pinpoint a number. You know, to me, I, I don't know that we can rely on only this idea of like an external financial incentive to drive behavior change. I think if we're stuck at this point of like, farmers aren't going to change unless like they get paid, like, what are you going to pay me? Like, that's not the right mindset to be entering into a, into a, a systems level change in your farm operation. Uh, Cause it's not going to, it's either not going to work out or it, it's going to be too difficult. It's not going to last long-term. Like that's where I think focusing first on the mindset shift is a really key piece of like our theory of change, because there's no amount of money you can pay someone to do something that they don't really want to do or something that they don't believe is better for their farm. It's like, we have to focus on the things that are better for the farm and ranch itself that also have climate benefits and we can invest in helping them get there. I don't know that like a perpetual payment for um, nitrous oxide reduction is, is necessarily going to be the way that large scale change occurs, but maybe, maybe it is, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. I was going to say that what it's worth, it's interesting that we're having this conversation with you because of what it's worth is, is what you're willing to pay for it too. And so like, I wonder, I don't know if there's any way to like have evidence for this, but I wonder if like the perception in farmer advice that this payment program is coming from a large income versus a government program. Because it because in a way you're saying as a company that you're willing to pay for it. You know, not directly. With scope three, and it's because in giving farmer payments, you're not like changing price trade premiums, mm -hmm. you know, unless you were like investing in uh, organic grains. But yeah, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, there was actually a study out recently on consumer preference for uh, perennial grain, and they saw that like if it was a hedonistic product, like a donut or something, like the the consumers didn't care at all about if it was like regeneratively sourced or not, but if it was like, a, if it was utilitarian, like my bread or my food that I have to eat, mm -hmm. then consumers like would be willing to pay a lot more for that product. It was super interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It's a fun study that you can talk about. Yeah, and so we do take like those two approaches, like we call like supply chain and supply shed. So it's like a lot of this work and most of our investment i'd say is going to this like supply shed work which is like how do we make investments at this landscape scale to get as big and as fast adoption as we can not worrying about if those farmers actually sell to general mills or not but there's other work that's it's like largely driven more by the organic brands that is more about how do we pull this change through all the way to the consumer and make it more of this kind of you know story that's connected from consumer down to farm and, and connect it more directly to the business proposition. So those are like two distinct approaches that we have. Um, yeah, with pros and cons to both of them. And I think, you know, there's gotta be some balance of both. Um, I love Cascadian Farms Kernza Crunch cereal, for example. <laughs> That's, that was a supply chain project that we continue to run, so. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, a lot more to talk about probably in regenerative ag approaches and stuff, but um, I'll jump quickly to some research and monitoring highlights. Uh, I tried to do my best to synthesize, oops, to simplify stuff because, um, you know, it's uh, we've just got a lot of different projects happening in all these different places. But if I had to bucket them into some, some categories, we've got a lot of on-farm research happening. I think that's been a place that we felt like we could really slot in because we've got these engagements with farmers, they're making changes. Let's, let's try and monitor what's happening on these farms um, to study all these different outcomes. Like I mentioned, like insects and birds and soil health and economics. Um, 
we're also doing landscape level monitoring. So part of the reason why we do that supply shed approach and this broader kind of landscape level change and the reason why we're doing some landscape level monitoring is because we are largely dealing with commodity supply chains that are shift. So, you know, our sourcing is really shifting around within these broader regions. So, you know, um, we buy like wheat flour and sell 50 pound bags of flour to local, you know, mom and pop bakeries. That's like one of our biggest customers for, for wheat flours, just small bakeries. But we need to hit certain protein levels and quality specs. And that is so driven by weather. So one year, most of that wheat could be coming from Western North Dakota. So, you know, some of it could be coming from Eastern South Dakota another year. Some of it's like, you know, Red River Valley of Minnesota or Kansas, Oklahoma. And it's kind of all getting blended from these regions. So we have really complex dynamic supply chains. And so that means that our supply chain is kind of the average of these whole landscapes. And so that's really been um, a big focus for us is trying to support landscape level change and understand what's happening at that landscape level. Um, we also do more like targeted direct, like on-farm outcomes verification. So when we're talking about like ecosystem service markets, uh, we contribute to the development of these protocols that are used to measure on-farm impacts to things like soil carbon sequestration, greenhouse gas reduction, water quality impacts, biodiversity impacts. Um, that enables claims like we have reduced X tons of greenhouse gases. Like to enable a claim like that, you have to have a you know, verified impact with a rigorous protocol. Then we do social science too. Um, so you know, trying to understand are these things that we're investing in, are they effective at changing farmer mindsets and behavior? Um, you know, is our approach really working to drive, to drive change in the way that we want it to? Um, so that's been another focus of our research approach. And I tried to summarize like what we've found uh, over the last four years in um, some simple bullets. Uh, so missing a lot of nuance here, but um, if I had to summarize and say it, regenerative farmers are clearly observing the benefits of regenerative ag. So in a lot of our programs, we like sur we survey the farmers and we ask them over time, you know, are you more profitable? Are you, you know, are you using more or less inputs? Are you, you know, generally satisfied with this program or, uh, you know, what kind of changes are you seeing to soil health and to biodiversity? And overwhelmingly farmer survey responses are positive in the kinds of impacts that they're seeing to economics, to soils, to biodiversity. But when we actually go out and measure those things on farms, the data is just messier, um, largely because we're dealing with weather. You know, in Canada, we saw the uh, driest year on record and the wettest year on record in the last three years when we've been sampling these things. So the data is messy. But um, still, that on-farm research, we feel like is really important. Um, it's just our early results are kind of a mix of positive. So we have seen some impacts, some positive impacts. There's a lot of stuff that's inconclusive still. Um, and some things are neutral, you know, um, not, not able to say really, you know, if, if, impact, if, if things are caused by regenerative ag or if they're going up or down or whatever. Um, we've been pretty successful in advancing uh, our ability to monitor regenerative ag adoption and its impacts at scale. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then we've also found that we really need advancements in our soil sampling approaches to uh, substantiate you know, our claims of regenerative ag on climate, specifically with soil carbon sequestration. I'll talk about that as well. Um, and generally we found like the social science work that we've done has really validated our uh, approach and the things that we're investing in. So farmers really finding the technical assistance it's one-on-one -on -one support, the social community network building, the local organizations that are really the ones fostering this kind of movement and culture building, like that kind of has been really validated by some of the science that we've, social science that we've invested in. Um, so I'll focus on these two here, um, unless there's a question, like burning questions on any other pieces. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm gonna talk about soil sampling first. Um, so, uh, we've kind of focused on a couple things in soil carbon research. Um, and a lot of it is around how do we sample better? How, like we, how do we, um, we need, we need some better insights to inform our sampling approaches to quantify soil carbon stock change. So I think there's this, there's big debate 
in, you know, about regenerative agriculture and its impacts on soil carbon. A lot of that is because we haven't been sampling particularly well as a soil science community. Um, so we've come out, you know, we're doing a lot of research in this space. So um, we just released a paper um, working with Mark Bradford's lab at Yale about sampling density, like how much do we need to be, how many samples do we need to take in a field to meaningfully detect change? Um, and the answer is quite a lot of samples, um, but there's things that we can be doing to increase our power to detect that kind of change, like using control sites and um, better understanding our sampling error by sampling in the same location one year after another. Um, and increasing the size of our projects, so sampling more fields and trying to quantify change at that scale as opposed to the individual field scale. So there's a lot we're learning about that, um, you know, sampling approaches. We've been doing work in fractionating these soil carbon pools into particulate organic matter and mineral associated organic matter to try and understand, you know, functionally how, how these different pools are different and how regenerative ag impacts them differently. Um, We've done some work, you know, a lot of a lot of our samples we take to like one meter and we are separating lots of depths to try and track over time what's happening with carbon below 30 centimeters, which is where a lot of people are sampling to. Uh, we've done some work on new soil probes. So it, we were just talking about yardstick a little bit earlier and we actually worked on uh, an early, we supported some research on the early prototype of that back in 2020. Um, and so there's lots of new probes that can sample, it can, can measure soil carbon without actually having to take a real sample that we're pretty excited about and testing out. Um, and then also looking at like optimal stratification approaches kind of tying back up to some of the work with Mark Bradford. So that's a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we're working on in that space. Still a lot to learn about how to soil sample to detect impacts of regenerative ag, but wanted to give a little overview there. Um, Another space that we've done a lot of work over the last six years is, is in this landscape level quantification. And largely this relies on satellite imagery coupled with biogeochemical models. So we work with a company called Regrow that has this Optus platform that's basically taking publicly available satellite imagery data and using that to understand tillage practices and cover crop use and crop rotations and residue cover um, on every field, you know, across, uh, well, you know, expanding globally, um, and then feeding that information into the DNDC model, which stands for denitrification decomposition model that's simulating soil processes and can help, you know, model what the environmental outcomes are of these different practices. So this is a screenshot of the dashboard that we've uh, worked out with Rigo on for a while, but, um, now is kind of part of their commercial offering called Sustainability Insights, where these are all of our supply sheds that I was talking about before. So like pink is our spring wheat and sugar beet, you know, supply shed up here. Um, and so we've got a lot of our supply sheds in this platform and, you know, they can now spit out all of this data about greenhouse gas emissions and soil carbon sequestration and tillage practices, cover cropping. We're pulling in public, you know, fertilizer application databases um, to really put together um, kind of a snapshot of what's happening at this landscape scale, um, which is very cool. Um, uh, I'll mention too, we're, um, we're using this information now to re report our greenhouse gas inventory. So most companies right now, when they do their scope three inventories, they're pulling emission factors for crops like, you know, for the things that they buy from global emission factor databases. Sometimes they're, you know, at the national level, um, but it's pretty coarse. And so we're, I think the first company to, to use this really place-based um, information using satellite imagery and modeling to update a lot of our assumptions about what our emissions are so that we have a really good greenhouse gas inventory um, that's dynamic each year and changes as farmer practices and weather change too. Um, doing some cool stuff in biodiversity monitoring too at scale. So we're using like microphones and infrared cameras um, and uh, seeing how we can create biodiversity indices and measure biodiversity a lot more efficiently than, you know, having a whole bunch of people out there in the field taking sweep net samples and looking at insects under the microscope. 
really trying to um, support these next generation technologies to, to create biodiversity and disease. Um, so last, last little piece here, um, something I've been excited about and that I'm gonna be focusing on a lot kind of here in the future is um, what's called a jurisdictional or landscape approach. Um, so so it's, I know it's too small to see, sorry about that, but um, I guess how I'd summarize what's happening with regenerative ag and climate smart ag is a lot of companies have and, and governments have their own climate goals. That's the way these goals are structured. It's General Mills has to reduce our footprint by 30% by 2030. Um, and we have an acreage target for regenerative agriculture that applies to our company. Um, but ultimately our goals are in service of bigger shared goals. Um, and instead of what's happening now is we're all kind of working on our individual goals in very siloed and sort of competitive ways that when it lands with the farmer, you know, if you see what's happening in the climate smart commodity markets, there's 25 different climate smart commodity programs touching down in Minnesota. So, and they're all trying to do the same exact thing essentially. So a farmer is gonna to have to sort through all these different programs to choose from, which is just not an efficient use of resources. There's 25 different MRV systems being set up to measure the impacts and all these complex systems to allocate credit to each individual company that's buying into them. So we're not being very effective in how we're spending money on climate and agriculture, um, not as effective as we could be. Um, and what they've kind of figured out in tropical countries for uh, tackling deforestation is that these individual projects have not been effective at reducing deforestation. Um, but when you nest that within a jurisdictional approach, so it's actually the government, this, this, the national or sub-national government that owns the commitment to reduce the deforestation and then the companies and you know uh, indigenous peoples and civil society and all these other stakeholders are plugging into this multi-stakeholder platform to collectively reduce deforestation and tackle that goal, it can be much more effective um, so that you don't have companies trying to do this on their own and governments trying to do this on their own. We're all kind of working together in this space. And so we're trying to apply what's been learned in, in these tropical countries to North America and especially Minnesota because Minnesota has state climate goals, water quality goals, that there's a lot of, you know, big food companies and agriculture companies that have the same exact goals. There's all this divergent, um, you know, investment in climate smart commodity markets, and we're all measuring things very different ways. So it just seems like um, this would be a great place to figure out how to pull these things together more formally under a jurisdictional approach for the state. Um, there's some cool work that like the Nature Conservancy is working on for frameworks for how to actually do this. Um, so it's still in its early phases, but this is something I'm excited about uh, for the future of this work. I'll leave you maybe with just a little story. Um, this is from a picture from a farmer meeting that we held up in Kenosi, Saskatchewan. This was the farmers in our original regenerative ag pilot up there. And the farmers were all giving each, like giving PowerPoints about their farm's journey over the last several years in the program, the things they were trying and learning. And this farmer's slide says the power of community on it. And he's just thanking all the other farmers in this room for helping him on his farm's journey and learning from them and just being that really awesome network of support for him and his farm as he's gone down this path. So um, that was a pretty cool, pretty cool uh, meeting that we had in story. And it's something that stuck with me about, this is really a social system that we need to be supporting. It's not just about financial incentive or you know one thing but it's really about building these people powered kind of movements and communities so yeah that's that's everything i've got i think we've got about 10 minutes for questions yep there's a lot of emphasis on that, on that at, at this university. Like, you mentioned Kaiser, for example. 
I'm just wondering from an industry standpoint, what are the bottlenecks? It seems like we've been working on that for many years now. I don't see a lot of adoption yet. And, um, what do you see as the future of this? Well, I think where we've been successful is in, especially with like the organic consumers. I mean, that's a lot of the currency that we're sourcing today is marketed to the organic consumer that really cares and know, like wants to know where their food is coming from, wants to be supporting these things that have more of these like for we benefits. It's beneficial for the planet. It doesn't just have a for me benefit. Um, I think what, what it's going to... small acorn, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And so I think yeah. the... Oh, sorry. Can no, I yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. It's a little inadvertent also because uh, most of the early adopters of Prenda happen to be retirement folks. Mm -hmm. um, and there are like the IR force leaders to even approve herbicides and pesticides. So that's, that's a bottleneck that I know of. Yeah. Well, I think, the, I think one of the things that could help drive maybe larger scale sourcing is just kind of proving it out as a climate lover because these companies, we, we have scope three climate goals. Um, I know one thing we've kind of been pushing for for a long time is like a really solid LCA on Kearns' climate impacts because if we can show, hey, this is a, a climate lever that we can put in our arsenal, you know, we've got a list of probably a hundred different climate levers that we're evaluating as a company and investing in and putting dollars per ton of investment against so what kind of levers are you? Well, it's everything from renewable energy to uh, electric trucks for shipping to um, different types of packaging to regenerative agriculture to lots of stuff in dairy, um, you know, related to manure and methane. So it's like it's anything you can think of. Um, and I think a lot of companies are doing that as they, they've set these 2030 goals, trying to figure out how do we get there? What's our glide path? Where are all the levers? If we had solid LCAs for Kernza or these other perennial crops, I think it puts it on the radar for more companies. Um, but I know it's there's challenges to to that. Yeah, it seems yeah. like it's going to take a while. Yeah. Sure, twenty thirty. Yeah. A bummer. I don't know. You hear about this yet? A bummer for Kernza that it was supposed to get to the comment form this year, which would have helped all of this a lot. And that project. Comment, oh, comment bar. So that's the adjacent model. It's underneath a lot of the carbon fiber. So that's like the mod, like, he was showing the NPC with one of the models, but comment bar was like a really popular. Steve, I got a technical question for you. This is from remote. Sure. Yep. Uh, you mentioned about the model regrow. And I understand you came from Colorado State. Yep. There was a recent article in the Star and Tribune as well as in the Science Magazine. You know, their companies are giving money to the farmers, but they don't have a very good handle on carbon, how much carbon is sequestered. And the, they, most of them are using the model from Colorado State. You got any opinion what's going on there? Yeah, I think part of, well, I haven't read the article in the Star Tribune, but um, I think what you're referring to is, is more about these kind of carbon markets where companies want to pay farmers for these verified impacts on soil carbon related outcomes. And um, part of what's tricky about the space is, uh, you know, so there's, so there's some doing this in offsets. So companies outside the food and ag sector buying a ton of carbon from a farmer, plucking that out of this sector and there's lots of rules around offsets and what you can do there. Um, I think they're very rigorous. So I, I would be surprised if they're quantifying that only using a model. I think for the most part in, in the offset space, companies are using a mix of sampling and modeling approaches. So you sample in year one to set a baseline. That's what the model is building off of. Then you sample again in year five to kind of true up the model. Um, so I think that's kind of the standard practice. There's also this scope three space that's different. So we're not buying offsets. We're, we're trying to, there's these carbon markets that are more focused on scope three and the rules for what is good enough in this space are still being defined. Um, 
by, you know, particularly the greenhouse gas protocol land sector removal guidance. I think there too, we're going to have to have a combination of sampling and modeling approaches because, you know, for, for me, one of the reasons why we're doing a lot of this focus on soil carbon sampling approaches is I don't think we can only rely on models to give us these estimates of soil carbon sequestration. I think they're good enough. And they're kind of the only way that you can scale to a, like a meaningful project size, but we have to be nesting within all of these carbon markets and projects, rigorous sampling done extremely well to actually be able to empirically detect soil carbon change. Because unless we can measure that at least on some fields, soil carbon has increased, I think we're um, the credibility of this whole space is at risk. So that's why we, you know, I think we're going to have to rely on models to scale, but like making sure that we're nesting rigorous sampling within these carbon markets is gonna be important to addressing a lot of those kind of credibility concerns. You have any opinion on the model that came from Colorado State? Yeah, I mean, Descent is, you know, it's kind of, there, there's like a handful of those biogeochemical models. They're all generally perform similarly. There's not like one radically better model than any other one. Um, I think generally it's considered that Descent, DNDC, they all do a decent job of simulating soil carbon dynamics. I think DNDC maybe does a slightly better job at nitrous oxide emissions, but I don't, I don't personally see a huge distinction between all these different biogeochemical models. Thank you. Yeah. What you were going to... You said you were willing to talk about this at the beginning, this transition from academia to industry. And one thing that came up to me is that you talked about this big accounting problem of your scope three emissions. And I, I'm thinking about this as the difference between an accounting problem and a science problem. Mm. I don't know. Anyway, I'd love to hear you kind of spitball on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so there is this whole world of scope three greenhouse gas accounting with lots of rules. Some of it is scientifically based, like how do you do a good inventory? It's all about, well, how do you report the reality of emissions to the atmosphere? And we have to be relying on good science to do that. But so much of the, the like when you're setting, when you're creating a policy, it's essentially a policy document that you're creating. So there's like, you have to take into account the science, but you also have to take into account what pe people can actually feasibly do. Um, and so for that, you know, you need to understand the nature of supply chains and like what actually companies have within their control to do. Um, and so that's just been an interesting space to step into where there's, there are just kind of like very science focused and, um, you know, soil scientists that are part of these conversations. There's like climate accountants that know all the jargon in this space. And then there's kind of industry people that, you know, I'm trying to sort of sit in the middle of some of these worlds and help to make guidance that people can't kind of like, there's no loopholes um, that will result in like accurate data when we report it, like when people report their inventories that it actually reflects what's happening in the atmosphere. Um, but also that's like actionable and that people will sign up for because a lot of this stuff is voluntary. So if you make it impossible, then nobody's going to do it. Um, and we need everybody doing it. So um, that's been a really interesting space to be part of uh, these last like two or three years. But um, if folks are interested in that space, you can check out the Small Science-Based Targets Initiative, the FLAG guidance, the Forest Land and Agriculture Sector guidance, and then the, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Land Sector Removals guidance. That's kind of the one there where there's a lot of these negotiations happening as it gets finalized. It's taken four years to publish guidance for how companies can report a greenhouse gas inventory in the land sector. So there's a lot to a lot that's been figured out. Oh, okay. Um, I was really interested in the very last slide about meetings versus like jurisdictional approaches. And and I I almost wonder like how much of it 
these competition and how much of this is totally inadvertent that so many people are like, oh, I have to do something. <laughs> that there are all these different things happening, like at the same time, they're very disparate and confusing. So, yeah. yeah so, what are, are, have you like taken enough steps down this path to think about like concrete ways to, that you can support moving toward this kind of jurisdictional or this more cohesive space? There's no incentives to work together right now because of the way our, because of the corporate accountability framework that we operate within. We, you know, companies are incentivized to meet their own targets, which means they want to support the things that get them credit. Um, but the things that you get you credit are really just like these direct payments for carbon or whatever. Um, and the reason you have so many different programs is because companies have different interpretations around like what is a good enough, what's good enough data to make this claim. Companies have different risk tolerances for the types of claims they wanna make. And so you see this huge proliferation of programs all delivering these like very company specific needs. Um, so it all comes back to kind of like these corporate accountability frameworks, science-based targets, how you do accounting. To me, I, I think like the paradigm that we're in is this attributional framework where it's like, we have to attribute every carbon impact to a company in order to get them credit for their goal. Well, I think some of the paradigm shift we need to like start to make is more towards a contributional framework where it's like, we've got this shared, we have shared goals and shared initiatives. What has been your contribution to that shared initiative? Instead of trying to piece out all the impacts and allocate them to everybody. Um, so that that's, that's going to take some time because, uh, you know, our science-based targets are what they are. I think we have to educate investors because they're really the ones that are looking to us for progress and our commitments. They're the ones that really are sort of setting the expectations for what good corporate climate action looks like. So I think we have to educate them so that they're asking companies questions like, why are all these programs and things that you're investing in just you, you know, why are you doing all this stuff by yourself? Um, I also think we have to build these landscape approaches and test them out in this kind of North American context to demonstrate what they actually look like. Um, but, you know, again, the problem is how do you convince a company to invest in a holistic landscape approach if you can't get them direct progress on their thing? So that's sort of the that's sort of the impasse, I think, for now. But you know, we want to step in and be sort of one of the leaders to demonstrate how it can be done. How we talk about these shared claims that are not just about us. Um, yeah, you need to almost be like the Minnesota version of like companies. If there was a leadership entity, like the state, for example, you could say like every company gets helped needs to help get some leadership and then we'll take contributions from there. Some some model like that that's like everyone needs to buy into it. Yeah, I mean yeah. I guess maybe within a voluntary framework probably yeah, because yeah. I, I don't know, but um but yeah I mean I think because I think what's challenging now is like it's the leaders that have science based targets that get all the scrutiny. But we're not looking at like who is actually creating emissions in a place and who needs to be at the table versus like who is at the table. You know, um, you know, we're a food company and like a lot of the food crops from these regions that we're sourcing from, it's like, they're not a, the biggest contributor of emissions in those places. And we don't have everybody that's representing those other industries at the table. So where's the corporate accountability? And that's, it's not a holistic accountability framework that's actually driving us towards the scale and types of progress that we need. It's really just raising the bar for the few companies that are that have these targets you know so i think these place-based approaches help you get after those larger challenges and you can see really who's contributing and who needs to be there and who's not you know so we'll see all right thanks